All right, so looking at this first one, the one by Johnson here, um, first of all, you'll notice that compared to the other ones, um, it is closer to the length that I've been telling you that a good introduction should be. Uh, you'll note that the other two are a little bit longer than what I'd recommend, um, although in one of the cases it's because of the high number of, of terms that they have to define. Um, so the actual text of the document is in keeping with that sort of length of about five pages that I've been telling you that you know is sort of the expectation. You'll see all three of them have a slightly different format and in many cases um, that is largely due to what the institution requires. So depending upon where you're getting your degree from, some will require a very st structured aspect to the chapter one. Um, what I've been describing to you is more of what you would find in the style guide. So if you're looking at Chicago or APA or MLA, the type of information I've been telling you to include in your introduction, that's what you would tend to find in those guides, which is why it tends to be what you see in a lot of the journal articles that you've been that you've reviewed as a part of your chapter two. Uh, you see that same format because most of the journals always say, you know, follow APA 6.0 or 6.1 style guide or follow Chicago 18 style guide. And so that's where you get that kind of introduction model. Um, so in some cases, these are going to be a little bit different, but, you know, let's take a, a, a general look at them. Um, so the first thing I'd like you to do is actually take about five minutes to read through Johnson, um, you know, to read through those five pages or so and see what's there, and then we'll pick it apart. We about good? Okay, I see most people saying yes. All right, so let's take a look at this one. If you look at what is essentially the first two paragraphs, that in a real academic way of talking is essentially what her personal interest, I think it's a her, isn't it? Someone look at the first page and tell me. It is a her? Yeah. What her personal interests were in this topic. You know, so while she does have a couple of citations in there, you'll note that at least one is done incorrectly. So even PhD students, even PhD graduates, because you know this is literally the last thing that she's doing. Um, and having had four committee members read through this, still didn't catch the error. Everyone see where it is, by the way? In that first paragraph with the citation? Sorry? Is it a name for the year? No. What's wrong with that first in-text citation? don't need a page number. It's not a direct quote, so you don't need a page number. Yeah. Plus, how would you ever cite three different people and have a page number unless they all wrote the exact same thing word for word? Yeah. Right? So, you know, after Council of Chief State Officers, comma, 1996, it should be a semicolon. Everything else about it is correct. It's in alphabetical order. She's got the... Um, commas where they should be, um, using the and symbol because it's in the parentheses as opposed to the word and, so all that's all right, it's just no need for a page number there. Um, you know, but with the exception of that sort of one citation that she throws in, the rest of it is just sort of her generally talking about, you know, this is really what interested her in the topic. Now, you know, having read through this, you can probably look at it and say, well, it's kind of geeky to have a personal interest in this for these reasons, but, you know, she's going off to be an academic, so, you know, she is a bit geeky, um, you know, because that's the nature of us academics, um, you know, we tend to become experts in like a little tiny field like that, 
and know very little about anything else. You know, and in her case, she had a real passion and interest about, you know, essentially what was being written in educational leadership books. Um, and that's what those two paragraphs, those first two paragraphs portray. You know, and if you remember when I've talked about chapter one, I always said you want to have a paragraph or two, roughly a page or so, that talks about, you know, briefly dis describes your personal interest in the topic. How did you come across this topic? You know, there's something in your personal or professional lives that attracted you to this particular topic. And it was more than just convenience, because there's a lot of convenient things that you could have studied. Many of them that were probably much easier than the one that you picked. Um, you know, but there was something that you had a specific interest in that drove you to this topic. You know, that's what you talk about in that first couple of paragraphs, as she has done here. So if you look at the next little bit, the statement of the problem. Now, she calls it statement of the problem, and you'll see a couple of the others will use, I think one of the other two will use that terminology as well. But as you look through, this is where she starts to essentially talk a little bit about the literature. You'll see there are a few more citations in there. Um, a couple of more mistakes in those citations, if you notice. Uh, looking at the bottom of um, what is page numbered two for you guys. Anyone notice the mistake there? Actually, there are two mistakes there, to be exact. Three. But one, I think, is just a typo. Yeah, the little apostrophe or whatever is after 2004 doesn't need to be there. Um, but I think that's the typo, yeah. if I had to guess. By the looks of it, I'm guessing they went to hit this, because that's the key right next to the semicolon yeah. key. So my guess is they went to hit the semicolon key and hit both of them, and that's just how. What are the other two errors? Yes, counsel should come first because they go alphabetical. Right. What's the third error? Yes. Yeah. There's one other mistake in that first, or in the, I guess in the the citation on page two. The D. The D. In the in-text citations, you just put the surname or the organizational name. Yeah. All right, so you don't need D period in there. See how much of an APA master you guys are? This, we're two pages into this. <laughs> Two pages into this dissertation, and you've already found four mistakes that this PhD student didn't find. But anyway, so if you look at it, I mean, this, starting here on page two, with a statement of the problem, you've got essentially what? Two, three, four paragraphs, well, really three paragraphs that are bringing in the literature. All right, so a little bit better than a page. If I had been advising this student, I would have recommended that in that first paragraph, where there are currently no citations, that she should find a piece of literature or two that supported, was supported by one of those statements. And if you look at the statements that she makes, you know, a review of or an examination of these books identified predominant themes. And those themes could be correlated to either be significant or pressing educational leaders. That's a value statement. In all likelihood, somebody said that. Somebody other than this author. For that matter, the second sentence. If it was established by the Interstate School Leaders Licensure Consortium, chances are they've got that published somewhere. So that could have a citation. Similarly, if you look at the last paragraph of that section, which 
um, is the last full paragraph there on page 3. So after her list of the six standards. This paragraph here, you know, could easily have citations in there. I suspect that particularly that second sentence, which really is, well, pretty much with the exception of the first line in a bit, it's the entire paragraph, you know. Is it considered that I mean, she's obviously paraphrasing that? Doesn't matter. If you if you're paraphrasing something that isn't pedestrian knowledge, then you, really then you sure are supposed to cite whoever came up with that idea originally. Or if it's a recognized term, like so if I'm using the term digital native, for example, well, it's not like copyrighted or trademarked. It's a recognized term that somebody originally talked about. You know, but those ideas, anything that you indicate that isn't pedestrian knowledge, so that the average person on the street. And what I always like to say is basically, if other people on your staff, if people who are familiar with what you're doing, like your spouse, um, you know, if it's something that they wouldn't necessarily know, then chances are it's not pedestrian knowledge. Um, you know, so those are the types of things that should be cited. So, you know, that's the main concern or criticism I'd have with this one. I would have liked to have seen more citations, not necessarily in the paragraphs where they are. Because you'll notice in many instances, you know, because this isn't the formal literature review, you'll note that, you know, she's got a lot of text here, and then two citations for just this one statement. And then in that same paragraph, she's got, you know, another sentence, and then three citations for that one sentence, two of which are ones she had used just above that. Right? So it's not the kind of pattern that you're used to with the literature review, and that's perfectly okay. You know, because again, you're basically just trying to whet the appetite of the reader. You're not trying to go through and provide that sort of, you know, comprehensive, detailed development of themes that are in the literature. You know, you're just giving them a little snapshot, a trailer, if you will, if you want to use sort of movie parlance. Um, as Alexandria noted, you'll note that at the top of page three, they make the same mistake in the Fiore um, citation that they made at the bottom of page two in the fact that the D shouldn't be there. Um, you'll note that they did get it in alphabetical order this time. So, so once you move past this, then you get into that last paragraph or so of what I've asked you to do in chapter one. So she tells you what the purpose of the study is. She actually goes through and describes in a little bit more detail than what I would recommend for you, but again, that's largely in part because this is a dissertation I'm asking you to do a thesis. So when she goes through and starts at the top of page four, the study then compared books, yada, yada, the research questions suggested. This is basically all her summarizing her methodology in a paragraph. You guys don't need to do that in your introductions. You want to basically say the purpose of this study is, and it can literally be word for word from your chapter three. In fact, not only can it be, it should be word from word. Because your purpose is not going to change. Purpose of your study is going to be the same, so you want to use the same language. You know, this led to the following research questions. You want to put what those questions are. Then, you want to basically have a sentence or two that describes your methodology. Now, you'll note she does this beforehand, as opposed to immediately following the research questions. But she basically, it starts there roughly with the however. You know, it was a qualitative content analysis. Um, so she's not looking at the variable relationship, and then she cites somebody as to why she'd do it that way. All right, that's essentially her couple of sentences about the methodology, which is all I'm asking of you. And for what you submit in that first assignment, that introduction assignment, that's all you need. Now, for the purposes of your thesis, when you submit this at the end of the semester, the one thing you will add to chapter one is this definition of terms. 
The reason we wait until the end to do that is because you're not sure what you're going to find in the results right now. You don't know what those results are going to lead to in terms of implications for practice or suggestions for future research. There may be specific terms that are either very broad in nature that you need to define because you're using this particular definition of it. And I'll use Laura as a good example, blended learning. You know, because this is my field, K-12 online and blended learning, I can tell you that Horn, actually Stocker and Horn, um, who work for the Christensen Institute, uh, produced a report, I think it was about three years ago, four years ago, that talked about the different models of blended learning. And in that report, they outlined seven different models of blended learning. The International Association for K-12 Online Learning has a definition for blended learning. Now, Laura, in her study, may be t referring to blended learning in that broad definition that INACL uses, or she may be referring to one of the very specific models that Stocker and Horn are talking about. In that definition of terms, because it's a broad term that means many different things to many different people, flipped classroom is another good example. You know, you ask 10 teachers what a flipped classroom is, you'll get 10 different answers. Right? So those kinds of broad terms, you want to define how you are using it the other type of term that you want to define are terms that are very esoteric to your area. Right, like for me, again, being someone involved with K-12 online and blended learning, virtual school and cyber school are two different things. They have two different meanings, at least within the literature. When you watch in the media and stuff, they'll use them interchangeably but they do have two very specific meanings, two very different meanings. That is something that is very esoteric to my individual field. So in the definition of terms, when I was doing my own dissertation, I would have included both of those terms to be defined, you know, because they are very specific to my area. You know, so if you look at the ones that we have here, educational leadership is one of those broad terms. And what she's doing is defining this is how I'm using educational leadership. By the same token, most people probably wouldn't know what the ASAA is. And even when you said the American Association of School Administrators, the vast majority of people have no idea what the American Association of School Administrators is. That's one of those sort of esoteric kinds of terms. Similarly, I mean, you guys are all, you know, nearly finished two programs in educational leadership. You know, your 092 program and your sixth year. How many of you had come across the Interstate School Leaders Licensure Consortium before tonight? Again, one of those very esoteric kinds of terms. And as you can see, right from the first chapter onward, she's using them a fair amount. So she wants to make sure that everyone knows what this term is. The one thing that you see in this document that isn't relevant to you, there's a section at the end that starts on the bottom of page 5 called Limitations and Delineations. In a doctoral thesis or doctoral dissertation, that would be something that would be included. For a master's and six-year thesis, that's something that you don't need to worry about. And the reason that, I mean, essentially what that section is talking about is that each of your studies... <coughs> are methodologically limited in some way, right? You're using a single school, a single classroom, a single district, right? Many of you are doing case studies. Actually, I think most of you are doing case studies, right? By virtue, a case study isn't generalizable beyond that case, right? So just because it happens at, in your case doesn't mean it's going to happen next door or on the other side of the state or on the other side of the country. That's a methodological limitation. Because one of the purposes of a doctoral dissertation is to create new knowledge for the field, they would need to include this in there because they would basically need to say, you know, okay, yes, here's what I'm presenting, but here's sort of all of my yeah, but kinds of statements. 
yes, I found this, but, you know, you want to keep this in mind. You want to keep that in mind. You know, essentially all of my qualifiers, if you will. You guys don't need to worry about that. You know, the purpose of a master's thesis or a six-year thesis is not necessarily to generate new knowledge. Um, in fact, if you look at the learning objectives for all three courses that you've been through now, 689, 690, and 691, at no point would you have seen one there that talked about generating new knowledge. Talks about, you know, essentially you guys becoming familiar with the research process, you understanding how to consume and generate research, but not necessarily generate new knowledge. All right, so that's why you guys don't need that limitations and delineations section. Um, you'll also see if you're looking at other samples, and I can't remember if it comes up in any of the other two that we've got, but oftentimes you will see in this first chapter significance of the study. And again, that's something that's more dissertation focused because of that notion to generate new knowledge as opposed to you guys who are essentially generating new skills. You know, the skills on how to conduct research and how to um, consume research. So that's the first one. That's Johnson. Any questions about this first one? All right, let's move to the second one and we can sort of go through this one a little bit quicker. So the second one is Monahan, 2012. If I remember correctly, this is a male. Thomas? Uh, Bobby. 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 Oh, then it is a female, yeah. B-O-B-B-I-E. All right, so because you're starting to get familiar with these now, as opposed to reading carefully like you probably did the first time, let's take three minutes to skim through this one. All right, let's take a quick look at this one. And you'll notice that, you know, much like the last one, it contains a lot of the stuff that we're looking for, although not necessarily in the same presentation. So if you look at the way this one is structured, it actually is sort of in the opposite of the one we just saw. So the one we just saw, we started off with sort of this is the personal reason why you know they wanted they were interested in this and then they moved into the literature focused reason. In this one, they actually go in the other direction. You'll see they start off very much with what I would suggest is probably a little bit, well, not I would suggest, what I would tell you is a much more detailed introduction than uh, introduction to the literature than what needs to be. Right? So if you look essentially at the first, what is it going to I think it's five pages. Yeah, basically the first four pages. That's really the introduction to the literature, the brief introduction to the literature. And not only in terms of page length do I think it's a little bit lengthy, but if you look at it like essentially almost a little bit better than half of page four are direct quotes. You've got another significant taking up about 20 to 25 percent of the space on page three, direct quote. Another one taking up about a third of the page on page two. That's a direct quote. All right, you know, these are things in the introduction I would suggest aren't necessary. You know, if that information is useful in terms of setting up the problem and what's known about the problem and where the gap exists in this particular area, then feel free to quote it in the literature review. In the introduction, because you're trying to provide that teaser, to me that's too much information. Take a sentence to paraphrase what the quote is telling you so that at least you can still get the information out there to tease the reader so that they actually want to know more about it when they get to chapter two. But that level of detail, I mean essentially of those four pages, you're looking at almost two pages are direct quotes none of which would belong, in my opinion, in the introduction. Um, you know, you might have one or two briefer quotes, or in the case of the last one we looked at, where there were those six standards, 
that set up sort of the framework that she was looking at for the rest of the study that she quoted word for word, and that was okay, you know, because it was just the one thing that she had there, and that was it. You know, this one here, to me, what they're doing in the introduction is really rehashing things that should be in Chapter 2, in the Literature Review. In the introduction, again, because you're just trying to provide a teaser, you're not fully developing out ideas, you're not, you know, you're just throwing out a few things that get the person interested and provide them with enough information so that they understand why this is important. Exactly. Um, so because of that, you know, there's no problem with having single citation paragraphs. In fact, I would probably expect that most of your introduction is likely to be single citation paragraphs because of that sort of teaser kind of nature. You know, again, you're, it's designed to briefly introduce the reader. You know, the whole point of this, I, you know, having multiple citations in a paragraph is because in the literature review, you're f trying to fully develop the idea, right? Here you're just briefly introducing it. Um, in terms of where her own personal interest comes in, she doesn't come out and quite say it like the previous author did. Um, but if you read closely, you can sort of figure out where it kind of, or you can make an educated guess as to where it kind of happens. And it happens near the bottom of page four is where it starts. Um, in the sentence it says, whether formal or informal, the support of a mentee, and then she talks about a particular document that is like 20 years old at this stage. Yeah, 20 years old at this stage, 18. Um, my guess is, and if you look at after she cites those 18 things, um, she mentions the fact that that forms a part of what she was doing in terms of her research. That there, I think, is where her personal interest comes in. My guess is, is that she was either being mentored or she was a mentor herself in a particular school or school district and at some point in time either her mentor or whoever was running the mentoring program introduced her to this um, National Association of Secondary School Principals document called Mentoring and Coaching Developing Educational Leaders and that's where this starts to come about and it's not just an interest in this because if you look at her statement of the problem, that couple of paragraphs there. That sort of ties into it. Because it's not just I was a mentor and I was introduced to this and because of that I was interested in exploring. In her case, it's the relationship of that sort of, you know, that role of mentoring and coaching and developing educational leaders, you know, through this document that she was introduced to through the lens of what's going on with educational reform and the fact that instead of being educational leaders, many principals and particularly superintendents are more managers and business people and coming from that more, um, you know, private sector thinking kind of background as opposed to educator, pedagogical kind of thinking background, you know, and so while, again, she doesn't divide it up, I think, that well, as I read through this, and I've had the advantage that I read through the rest of the dissertation as well, um, so I'm able to sort of make that assumption with a little bit of confidence. But to me, that's sort of where her personal interest comes in. Um, you know, she was involved in some kind of mentoring program, either on the side of the mentor or the mentee. Um, as a part of that program, she was introduced to this document. And the types of things that she was seeing in this document either spoke to or were at odds with what she saw happening in the current educational reform movement that we've got going on in the U.S. And that's where her interest comes from. Following that statement of the problem, so again, keep in mind she did it in the opposite order, and that's perfectly okay as well. Starting off with the literature and then moving into your personal interest. You know, I think if you remember back to 690 when we talked about, um, you know, just how structuring an article and structuring a, a thesis, when we talked about those two topics, briefly introducing the literature, briefly introducing your personal professional connection to it, they can go in either order, whichever order makes sense to you. And in some cases, a lot of it depends upon how you came up on your topic. You know, some of you, because of your professional interest, 
started to explore a particular area. Others of you started to explore a particular area and then based upon what you found, managed to craft a study that was of personal interest to you based upon what you saw in the literature. Depending upon what that journey looked like for you may help you in terms of sequencing those two sections. You know, if you came to this already with something in mind and went into the literature with that, maybe your personal or professional interest comes first and the brief introduction of the literature comes second. If you just had a topic in mind, you know, like I'll use myself as an example again, just someone who was interested in K-12 online learning and started looking at the literature to find something I could do in my professional context that hadn't already been done that I could study, then I might start off with the literature first and then connect it to my own personal interests. Either or is okay. Um, you know, and, and it's largely up to you and how you came about your topic. If you look at this next section, uh, the next sections are a little bit more direct in terms of the way in which I would expect you to, although <coughs> I will tell you to not stick so many headings in there. If you remember, some of you have seen this as you've been doing your Chapter 2 and Chapter 3. APA tells you to avoid single paragraph headings. All right, so they also tell you to avoid single sentence paragraphs. So when you have a heading called the purpose of this study, and then in that entire section there is one sentence, that is violating two APA rules right there. Now it's okay to say something like, you know, my research study or this thesis study, and then have your purpose, have your research questions, have your sentence or two about your methodology as a paragraph that ends the document. Now you'll know this person tells us the purpose. She also gives us her one research question. She doesn't tell us anything about the methodology there, which is one of the shortcomings of this. <coughs> you'll notice that she'll define the terms here. So because most of the terms that she's using are those kind of broad terms that have many meanings to many people, she starts off almost every single one of them with for the purposes of this study. What that's telling you is that there are many definitions for this term. The one that she is using for her thesis is this. And it's perfectly acceptable to use that particular terminology. So you'll notice coaching, experienced superintendent or district leader, inexperienced, mentee, all of them, mentor, very broad terms. She begins every one of them with for the purpose of this study. Then she talks about limitations, which again is something I told you you guys don't have to worry about. Delimit delimitations, again something you don't have to worry about. The thing that the first example had, or didn't have, sorry, that I expect yours to have is some kind of summary paragraph. So you'll see on the bottom of page 8 here, she begins with a summary paragraph. Yours will look a little bit different than this. In this, what you'll note is she basically takes the first three sentences, which is roughly most of the paragraph, to summarize what she talked about in chapter one. You'll still do that, but you'll probably do it in a much briefer fashion. Now, the terms and the summary won't be added till the very end. Now, there's a reason why the summary won't be added till the very end. You'll note, and this is a shortcoming of this one in all honesty, while she does summarize <coughs> chapter one, which is something that you will do, she only previews chapter two. Your chapter one summary, when you submit your thesis, will preview the remainder of your thesis. So you'll have a couple of three sentences that summarizes what you said in chapter one. And then you'll have probably a sentence, maybe two, but probably closer to one sentence that summarizes each of the following chapters that will come after it. All right, let's move to the third and final one, which is Fountain or Fontaine, depending on, I guess, what part of the country and 
what ethnicity or well, from Louisiana, so I'm going to say Fontaine, given that it's from Louisiana. Jason Morgan Fontaine. All right. So take, again, two or three minutes to quickly read through this one. This is the one that the complete dissertation is available in Blackboard. So the other two were, because you notice preview was written across it. There's no preview across this one. So this is the one that the complete one is. Um, and just in case you're wondering, it's a 143 page dissertation, which I would suspect is actually quite light for dissertation purposes. But the complete document is there. Alright, let's take a quick look at this one. So, starting up at the top of page one. What we get, essentially, is a paragraph that provides the author's personal or professional, and in this case, by the looks of it, I would suggest it's probably professional. If I had to guess, I would probably guess that this person is or was a principal. A principal of a school that had a teaching staff that spanned the generations, if I had to guess. Um, just based on what he says here and also what comes up in later on in particularly in chapter 3. Um, so we've got a paragraph that provides that personal interest and one of the reasons why I chose this one and I'll be honest with you I chose all of these for very specific reasons um, both in terms of topics and because of what they offered or didn't offer or ways we could critique them um, as we were going through. Um, this one here, because it's a topic that we've used as an example in the past, and if you remember some of the samples we've used for lit reviews and stuff like that, have been using the generational differences literature, and it's one that I tend to use verbally as an example a fair amount. Um, so it's one that might be a little bit more familiar. The one about educational leadership textbooks I thought might be of interest to you guys being you know, students. And, and then the one about mentoring and coaching in the educational leadership environment. I also thought particularly relevant for you uh, beginning and aspiring administrators. So essentially this one, one of the reasons why I picked it was that, you know, I've been telling you that the introduction, the brief introduction to the literature and the brief introduction to sort of your personal or professional reason should be a paragraph or two. This is a nice, succinct, broad, brief introduction in a single paragraph. Right, so it's a very good example of you know the type of thing that you would want and close to you know where you'd want to be aiming for in terms of length. You know I said a paragraph or two which means that you're going to be a page or less. Right, and as you can see this particular one takes up about 60 percent of the page, not a little bit better than half of the page. Then Starting on the bottom of page one, we move into the brief introduction to the literature. His brief introduction to the personal topic was a little bit better than a half a page. His brief introduction to the literature spans two and a half pages. Again, like the second one that we looked at, I would say that this is a little bit too much in terms of that brief introduction. Particularly when you get to page four and you're looking at the purpose. You know, because if you know you had a chance to skim through what were on those first three pages, you've heard me talk about generational differences numerous times throughout the last four or eight months. The amount of information that you need to know to be able to understand this particular study that he's talking about here on page four, why it's important and you know enough that you can understand you know what he's doing. Essentially you need to know that there are different generations. We might even name them baby boomers, generation X, you know, neo millennials or millennials or um, generation me as twinge calls them today's student or today's young worker if you will 
depending upon who you read, goes by a number of different labels. Digital native, net generation, generation me, millennial. One of those, the one by Twinge, generation me, this is what she says. That's really all that this, it's all really that Jason here needed to write to get you ready for this purpose. Right, so when you're looking back on pages, you know, second half of one, two, and three, what he writes in that first paragraph of the introduction background on the problem, yeah, that's useful information. What he writes in the second paragraph, that's useful information. You know, because he's telling you what the different generations are, roughly where they span that kind of thing. So we're up to about 75-80 percent of one page right now. Much has been written about you know this generation in the you know in terms of their working. Okay, that's useful information. Starting in the paragraph that begins writer, that's where really you're getting into okay this is where we're hitting lit review here now. You know, this is more than what I need to know in order to understand this topic, why it's important, and, you know, the terms that you're using to do it. Similarly, pretty much everything in the next paragraph that goes these studies concerned. The last paragraph on page three, yeah, I would probably still include that because that's where he finally differentiates twinge from the other people. All right, so essentially we would have eliminated, if I had been his chair, I would have tightened up the first three paragraphs, probably combined it into two. That would have been about, I'm going to say, three quarters of a page would have gotten rid of paragraph 4, gotten rid of paragraph 5, and then paragraph 6 could have stand, which is the last one on page 3, could have stood the way it looks now. All right, and I'm telling you this and sort of editing this as I would a chair of this study because I want to give you a sense as to this is what you should be aiming for. You know, So when you see this, get rid of all that stuff I told you to get rid of. Imagine those first three paragraphs, if you could eliminate about a third of what he said in there and then put number paragraph six the way it is, that's sort of, you know, the level that I'd be looking at from for you guys. Getting on to page four, unlike the others, he starts off with the goal for the study, which is perfectly acceptable. And some of you I know in your chapter three started off with a goal, then a purpose, then research questions. Because, you know, when we are in 690, we had some information about each of them. And, and if you want to include the goal, then the purpose, then your research questions, that's perfectly acceptable. If you didn't write a goal in the first place, don't worry about it. Don't think you need to do it now. Just tell me the purpose and the research questions. You'll note that he has five of them. Now, in his case, it's a quantitative study, so it makes it a little bit easier to have multiple questions because all the answers, if you'll note, are yes or no. All right, so they're all done through statistical analysis. Actually, if I remember correctly, most of them are done using regression analysis. Uh, so it's either statistically significant or not statistically significant, which means he either rejects the null hypothesis or fails to reject the null hypothesis, um, which makes for a really tight chapter four, which is probably why it's only 143 pages. Then he goes through and provides his definition of terms. You'll note that he starts off with a sentence for the purpose of this study, whereas the last one we looked at had that in each of the terms. Either way, both are perfectly acceptable. Um, this one is a little bit less repetitive. All matter of personal preference. Some people, you'll note, like the first person, I don't think used the phrase for the purpose of this study at all. It was assumed that if I'm defining terms, that it was for the purpose of this study. Again, that's all, and again, one of the reasons that I selected these three 
looking for different models to provide you with different options so you could figure out what your own personal preference was for these kinds of things. Assumptions, justifications, um, delineations in scope, all things you don't need to worry about. That's all dissertation kind of stuff that you don't need to focus upon for a six-year thesis. Note that he doesn't have a summary or preview of what's coming up, um, you know, which is, again, something I would have made him add had I been chairing. Any questions on this third one?